Francis. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are happy to be here. We, we appreciate you all who are able to join. As you can see, we'll, we, we are so far six of us, but I'm sure other people will be joining as we move forward. Um, I will, my name is Irene, Irene Mawel. I'm speaking to you from Malindi in Kenya. Um, and I have my co-presenters uh, who are with us here and I let them uh, introduce themselves. I am a member of, of, of the Imagine team and I'm happy that you could join us. Uh, over to you, Alice, please introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Alice Abalo Zambodla. I'm talking to you from a, a sunny but very windy East London uh, in South Africa. I'm taking my chances uh, with the system. I'm hoping that I'll be able to stay on and chat to you for the, for, for the, for the hour that we have together. A warm welcome to you all. Indralitsa. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alice and Irene. Hi, everyone. I am Relixa, and I'm also from Ghana, right in the heart of the Garden City at KNUSD. It's very sunny out here, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you on this afternoon to share our experiences with you. So I'll hand over to Irene. Sorry, Irene, to uh, yes. for rolling for us. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Ralitza. As usual, you know that we will be recording the session. Uh, uh, and it is streaming live on YouTube as we speak. So if there's anyone who can join us on the webinar itself, they can also join us through YouTube, wherever they are. So it is streaming at the moment. Um, thank you for those who are joining us now. I, we appreciate you. Um, we had the privilege of going to the um, e-learning Africa conference uh, in Abidjan, in Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, we represented, the three of us, Alice, Al Ralit, and myself, represented uh, the Image team, the Image Africa team, and we thought of sharing what some of the highlights or some of the things that we picked up from, from, from the conference. So yes, so we are looking back, the conference took place, uh, it was hosted by the Sofitel uh, Hotel in, in, in Abidjan, and the conference was between the 23rd and the 25th of October. So we... So we, we, we will uh, probably... Uh, Alice, probably you can tell us about uh, uh, this slide. I'll hand over to you and probably the next one. Okay, cool. Um, the focus on this year's um, conference was on the keys to the future. The theme was the keys to the future, learnability and employability. And I think for me, what was really interesting about the conference this time was the focus of, of, of the conferences more and more on youth, um, youth and equipping them with the skills that will enable them to be employable in, in a world that where, where technology is changing fast, we're moving into the fourth industrial revolution and where a lot of our education uh, systems and offerings for our higher education institutions are not keeping up with the rate of change. So um, the conference was sort of had many, had a whole lot of different uh, interactions and sessions that were in very many different formats. Uh, we had um, core dialogues, uh, we had um, discovery demos, knowledge exchange. Irene, you can change this, the slide. Um, the knowledge factory, there was a whole lot of panel discussions and talks. We had two uh, plenary sessions, one on the Thursday, one on the Friday. And there were some pre-conference events and of course the poster presentations. So there were lots of different formats and spaces and places in which people could sit, could dialogue, could discuss, uh, uh, could unpack um, the issues that were were being looked at. Irene. Uh, 
Are you are you handing over to me or you'll continue? Yes, you can, you can continue. <laughs> you know. Thank you, thank you, Alice. Yes, there, there, there was quite a bit of of, of um, uh, sessions there, and uh, it, the menu was full, so you had something for everyone. The match team, um, we we went around talking to different people to promote the network. Um, of course, you always start from what is Image Africa? What are you doing? Some people know us, and some people don't. So it always depends on where we find the, 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 you know, the, the people, the partners that we speak with. So here we were, we were um, as we were learning our French or revising our French, we also met with quite a number of people. And as you can see, the second photo is from, uh, it was the Finnish stand. And uh, this was, was, I think they were representing quite a number of, of organizations from Finland. So that is how we were networking, just talking to different people and also knowing what they do and, and moving forward. Um, yeah, then uh, Ralitza, do you want to speak to the keynote, please? Irene, I think you've missed a slide. That one, yes. The, the the first keynote. Yes, that's the first keynote. Yes, please. All right. Um, I, I'll speak to it. Uh, Relator, would you like to go first? It's fine. You can start then. I'll take the second one. All right. Um, our first keynote was on the Thursday morning. Um, it was really interesting. I have to admit the bits of it that we could understand because um, uh, two, two of the speakers spoke in French, but the focus of that keynote um, was on the role of education in preparing Africans for the future and, and how education would have to change, uh, taking into consideration that we've got a rapidly increasing technological change and the coming of the fourth industrial revolution. So the speakers who spoke spoke about how Africans can be equipped to create social progress and prosperity for all, and also took a good look at how technology can be used to enable African education and training to rise to the array of challenges faced. Um, one of the people who spoke was a gentleman called Ifosa Ejomo, who kind of unpacked some of the challenges we face. For example, the fact that money is spent on everything except education. And he pointed out that in Nigeria, only about $120 is spent on a person uh, every year. And yet in 2035, it is anticipated that there will be 450 million people needing jobs, but only 100 million jobs available. So basically pointing out that a whole lot of innovation and new and fresh thinking was going to be required to deal with these situations. And he felt that the types of innovation that needed were uh, market creating innovation, um, innovations that were sustaining and innovations that were geared around um, efficiency. So he felt that um, taking these into consideration, there was a need for re-education to fill gaps. Um, and he gave examples, for example, uh, we needed innovations in computing, um, therefore needing um, democratization of access and new jobs and improved production. Uh, he also felt that, um, and we all Kind of think the same way that innovation is needed in our higher education system because it's elitist and only very few people are accommodated and they're not accommodated um, they're not equipped to deal with uh, the changing environment um and, I, and that was just one of the speakers there were four of them but that was the one that sort of caught me the one that that focused on the fact that we've got to change the way we think about education we've got to make it accessible to 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 people and to think about education within the context of the emerging market and the emerging environment rally all right um thank you very much um alice for that um, wonderful highlight 
I also like to speak a little bit about the keynote session too. And for this particular slide, you can see a youngster actually speaking about his experience with um, online learning and trying to stay connected and still study in the phase of um, revolution. On this day, we actually, we actually still had more people speaking, but one of the key things that stood out for us was to see uh, Mahid Abdul Karim speaking about his experiences. He is actually a student um, in Sudan, and um, he spoke about the impact of um, the revolution in Sudan on his education. He then went on to describe what it was like to try to carry on studying during the unrest when going to school, and this became very dangerous. So he had to find an innovative way to actually study. And as um, um, Alice mentioned earlier, um, the focus for this particular event this time was very much for the youth. So it was quite nice to see um, a young person speaking about his experiences to actually um, encourage other young people to look at opportunities available to improve upon their skills. So as uh, Mahid went on, he spoke about how um, unfortunate it was that he had no access to internet and and it was not possible for him to complete online. But the nice thing was that um, with access to um, ICT tools, it became extremely important for him to be able to connect. And this uh, made it possible for him to complete his, his studies by simply learning online. And he went on to speak that e-learning is the future and the future is also um, here because of e-learning for tomorrow and for, for young people. So one of the key things also was that, that stood out for us was that for a future where learners aren't so dependent on teachers and they can focus on their learning instead of just um, focusing on only what is um, given to them by their, um, le their teachers um, was something that um, um, e-learning has actually brought into the learning space to make learning um, easier for young people and also make uh, materials available for young people and also provided more opportunities for better programs for them to improve upon their skills. And his case was a classic example because in the face of unrest, there was actually absolutely no way he was actually going to complete his syllabus and study and make it um, with, with just um, being in that situation. But so thanks to Elen, and that was really good for us to see another way in which we can learn and in which other people can consider that and also calling government's attention to look at how learning can be made more accessible to people in um, underserved communities or low resource communities within the African sub-region. And then, Another um, striking um, presenter was um, Jeff, Jeff Stade, and he works for the Red Monkey Company from Belgium. And he spoke about the fact that 80% of the learners that are engaged in our settings are not passionate about what they do. And then he showed um, a 3D um, printer that he has created from a, a smart 3D um, generated prints about the brain. And then he demonstrated practically about how we just um, do a lot of road learning, things go in and then people just pass their exams and then they forget. And so he spoke more about what if we, we start um, looking at re-engineering our education and embrace the passion and talent of young people so that people learn because they want to learn. It's not that we are forcing the learning into their heads. And also real learning actually happens when you are in a groove with your, with your talents. And then he spoke about talents um, being diversified to add value to, to, to people's skills. And then he also touched on passion and spoke about the evolution and then suffering. So, there was a, a scenario about when people normally say they are sometimes passion in our current dispensation, it means that the person might actually be suffering to do something because you are doing it because um, you probably want to do it and you are um, depleting all your resources and everything. But how can we harness these resources in a way 
that will channel people's um, skills and convert those skills into talent and explore um, ICT tools to make it um, possible. Because now we are in the information age and we can make learning more accessible um, to people in this um, dispensation. And then he also um, spoke about learning as a physical process. We need to make learning more practical and also consider things like a problem-based learning, like practical approaches to things so that it's not so abstract for learners. And um, a classic example was the, the 3D brain. Um, he is printed with his 3D printer to demonstrate um, what he was talking about by turning it on and then it sort of lights up the brain. And then when you turn it off, it just goes off. And it was actually how he saw how the current system was operating. So um, um, in a nutshell, he spoke that the people with passion and talent should have the freedom to accelerate their learning. We should create more opportunities for people to actually innovate, um, explore, and actually come up with, um, um, develop their talents. And um, with ICT tools today, there is no limit to what one can do because we actually virtually have technology for almost everything that we want to do. We must just redirect people's learning in relation to their skills in order to turn talent into skills and then also skills into success. So on this particular question for us to reflect on. Okay. And then, so a lot of the the conversations were about uh, what do young Africans want and what to learn about, you know, what sort of skills would they like and what needs, what's needed to transform their talent to tomorrow's skills that are required. Um, Irene, you can change. Um, so there were a whole lot of different core dialogues. These are uh, some of the core dialogues that we kind of attended or participated in. Um, uh, the future of education. I attended um, a, a discussion where Stephen Downs says, um, te technological, social, cultural, and environmental factors are important. And we need to take cognizance of the fact that we'll have more people than jobs in the future which means we need to enable people to defend for themselves. In other words, to have, to have agency and be able to adapt to changing um, situations. Um, we need to focus less on what industry and politicians think is needed and focus on what individuals think they need to learn and when they want to learn it, which is, is, which is a big change, I, I think. Are moving away from that sort of thinking into actually what do individuals think they need to learn and what they want to learn. And the fact that therefore such learning should be just in time, it should be informal and not necessarily credentialed. And I know that in our uh, uh, context, credentials are still a really uh, big thing. You know, every time you say you, 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 you're offering some sort of training or skills development, people want to know if they're going to um, receive some form of, of certification. Mm -hmm. um, but as Stephen Downs is saying that actually the reality is that that piece of paper doesn't necessarily say anything about a person's ability. And so he's saying um, that uh, people's ability will be seen in their work and that credentials are less important than evidence of the capacity or the ability to do the things. And he's saying that evidence of, 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 of people's capacity and ability will be seen through their individual digital footprints. So he was looking at digital footprints as a way of providing some form of um, a credentialing that will ensure uh, or assure people that people can do the things that they can do, especially in this fourth industrial revolution space. Um, Matthias Matthias talked about classrooms of the future and the need to change. He says we can't wait until 2050 to change as 
65% of young people already are joining a marketplace where jobs um, don't exist, um, job expectations are ever changing, and the job of the future lies on an ever evolving continuum, um, which takes you from the classroom to campus to the office of the future. So he sort of unpacked um, a little bit about uh, what experiences are needed to be in place with, with regards to people and technology, and also unpacked what, uh, what might be um, important and, and, and what might be considered to be meaningful outcomes. And he was basically saying, we need to reinvest in learning um, what we teach and how it's taught and that learning should empower and enable and enable new modes of instruction with student-centered learning involving teaching students how to learn and having classrooms where people are engaged, where people are collaborating and co-creating and that such learning should be experience-based. Um, the coding in schools is um, a, a theme that's beginning to recur more and more and the need to target uh, young people and engaging uh, youth in, in coding. Um, there was a, a presentation, there was a session that I chaired um, um, that had uh, three different participants presenting the work that they're doing uh, with youth in this space and um, it's, a, it's an evolving space and it's a space that's being pushed really hard and is being pushed especially taking into consideration that coding is a space where um, they're also encouraging a lot of, of young females um, to get involved. Irene and Ralitza, would you like to talk about the virtual learning experiences? Um, um, thank you. Thank you, Alice. I, I wanted to speak about the moving from centralized to decentralized oh, yes. to distributed. That was something that came often or came up a lot um, in, in, in the several sessions that I attended. And uh, the workshop that I attended, it was a pre-conference pre, pre uh, event. The conference I attended uh, was addressing the, I uh, was talking about how uh, uh, learning resources of the future will look like. And they were saying that we are moving to a, a, um, a time when students will actually create their own learning content, uh, where less licensing will fade, where nobody will need any license, where things will be more distributed as opposed to centralized and uh, decentralized, right? And, uh, you know, uh, um, Selling content will be a thing of the past and the way we write into journals and, and, and put it there, that will not uh, uh, be possible anymore because everything will be distributed. So the, the, the way they were saying the distribution is everybody who touches a document will be able to share it because they will not need any license, they will not need it then. It, 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 it comes back to where uh, people will not worry so much about plagiarism anymore. As far as people understand that you need to say where you got your, 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 your information from. So it was quite interesting to actually sit in a session or in several sessions where they were talking about the distributed, the distribution of, of, of information for the future it was one of the, of the things. Now, for the planning experiences, of course, women um, with, with their team at the platform was being introduced by GZ. And probably we'll just touch on but it's one of the virtual learning experiences that uh, that was introduced and, and many more where uh, people will actually uh, not just sit in classrooms because then like UNESCO, thinking about future of education, were thinking, were saying that students or learners need to learn how to become, 
you know, learning how to become as opposed to learning just to learn. So you learn things that are going to help you in whatever you have to do. So this, this, these core dialogues were kind of correlated, you know, because everywhere where you went, someone was touching on something about the future of education or learning to become, and they were going to coding. Or our, our learners need to know how to, to create their own content and then to the distribution or the openness of, of content and then how uh, the virtual learning experience will really, will really enhance everything. So those are the things. I don't know if, Valitza, are you back online? You could talk to us about uh, probably the coding and the virtual learning. Are you back? Yes, I'm back. Oh, I hope you can okay. hear me. <laughs> yes, we can. Yes, yes, please. Uh, yeah. Okay, so about the, the coding in schools, I, I think as uh, Dr. Alice uh, noted, it was actually one of the most common trends. You can actually see a lot of um, coding being introduced to schools and in and, 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 um, different communities. We had a few people from, from Kenya also sharing their experiences about forming coding groups in their countries and also training people with, into coding in order to provide them with some skills that they can actually apply in practice and also create jobs for them. And one of the young men from, from Ken, uh, Kenya mentioned that um, the fact that a lot of people came to study coding in his hub provided a lot of jobs for the young people and almost like a 100% job rate for, for his guys. So there's actually a lot of potential there. There were also quite an interest in promoting young girls into coding as well. And this was quite an interesting phenomenon. Also, um, I would like to touch a bit on the virtual learning experiences as well. Um, in addition to what Irene said, there was also quite a lot of virtual learning um, stuff going on. A lot of people were trying to introduce that in their school, but yet, of course, the challenges with providing facilities and making sure there is um, adequate um, connectivity and all that was quite um, still there, present in, in most African communities. So it was evident that um, most of them were trying to overcome it by providing centers where people can join um, some of these um, learning programs online so that they can all study. So there was quite a, a classic case where you even have a lot of adult learners um, who are able to study and also get their degree simply because now it's, it's a virtual learning environment and they don't have to feel stigmatized by going into the former class where they feel that they are in the class with their, their um, people of their own kids' age. So that was um, one of the, of the key things that were standing out. And of course, there were a lot of people from both um, uh, different countries in different languages, including Arabic speaking countries that um, spoke about their introduction to um, virtual learning um, experiences. So that is um, basically one from that. And then from the moving from centralized to decentralized to distributed, it was also highlighted that the issue about um, creating more open line senses so that more people were says, just like Irene said, we are going more and more into sharing economies and distributed economies. And also, we are also in the knowledge economy. So in that sense, the more we share, the more we learn, and then the more we can actually develop and people can actually learn stuff that they can actually practicalize and help them to do something. So it's no longer too much of a theory base. So that's basically that. I hope that I'm still online yes you are you are you are okay you are. all right so and that's it for that so maybe if you would like to move to the next slide or uh, if there's anything yes. else um, yeah you like to add on this as as, as we move to the next slide one w w w uh, there was something else about infrastructure that was missing um and i see jerome has asked that question about the involvement or the 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 you know, the, the participation of governments in some of these things because uh, uh, of people who have raised the idea or the issue of where 
the Kenyan government uh, said that they were going to give uh, computers to all uh, kids joining primary education or primary schools and and there were so many things that were never thought through from so everybody who was standing and, and commenting was saying this is the same thing that is going on uh, they talk about oh we are going to advance we are going to do this we are going to do big things but they forget about the simple infrastructure the simple that need to be in place for this to happen so we have more dialogues. Uh, do you want to go on, uh, Ralitza, please? Um, okay. Um, all right. So I think that um, in terms of empowering education through uh, continuous uh, professional development, there were um, one of them were through the workshops and the preliminary um, workshop that was um, organized um, to give people the opportunity to learn more about these things. And as part of the continuous professional development, there were a lot of um, German companies, for example, the DEFCO um, Academy, uh, actually, which is part of the European Union, are actually providing um, open source education for people to learn more and also enhance their um, professional skills and learn also more about their e-learning capabilities. And of course, under that, we also took the opportunity to speak a little bit about our info course so that people can actually see more the other opportunities that are there for them. We also came into contact with another um, English uh, company who also only do not offer um, continuous professional developments just in, in the e-learning space, but they provide a platform for um, all other spaces. We can make the links available for everyone to assess after the meeting um, in the area of health and anything that you can think of. So they've created a system where people can join and also access learning to be able to um, improve their skills. And of course, the open universities and how they are transforming Africa education, it's also cut across all the distant learning and all the opportunities that were there. But um, it was evident that in some instances, there were a few product-based solutions um, rather than a more open source um, solutions to sort of address um, the ever um, challenges confronting education in Africa. So when we were looking at how we will redefine this teaching and learning in universities, we were also looking at how some of these opportunities that were there could be more made open source for more people to assess. So these were some of the dialogues that, that went on. And of course, um, it was also quite um, difficult to, to look at how some of these silos could be broken, but it was clear that there should sort of be some kind of freemium opportunities for some of the open, um, uh, what we call it, solutions that have been provided to make it more open so that people can assess for a period before it becomes more, um, I mean, you need to pay before you are access it, you know, but they were quite brilliant um, solutions which could actually address some of the African um, um, problems. So we, we had very um, informal, interactions with them in dialogues and people could actually attest to that. And in some instances, you can tell that um, some people who brought in their products were quite unsure of the African terrain and were now getting a bit more familiar with it and the expectations had to be minimized a bit and readjust some of the solutions that were being brought on the market. So these were a few things that, that came up. But it was quite quite um, good solutions, but of course we hope that um, in the future um, we will have more open um, um, solutions that people can use, and then we'll see how the uh, what we call it the payments part can be looked at in in future. So basically, these were some of the dialogues in all these areas that um, we saw going on in the in the conference from discussion to even the exhibitions and everything that we saw. So um, thanks very much, Irene. Um, would you like to 
move to the next yeah, slide. Yeah. And there, that's okay. Um, I was wondering if, if Alice has something to, to add, especially on the open universities uh, transforming Africa. Have something to say about that as we move to the next slide, please. No, I, all I feel is that um, the, 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 the open universities are, are becoming kind of uh, a more acceptable uh, concept or idea. I think there was some resistance to them um, initially, but the reality is now that, that there is an, a need for, for, uh, for openness, to open up... Um, to open up access and to look at things from an open um, perspective in order to, to sort of start the move away from um, being uh, sort of have a more elitist uh, a focus and, and, and move towards being um, institutions that are, um, are for the people because we, the people need them. Literally, that's it. Thank you. Um, so we had some sessions prepared. Um, um, probably I'll myself. Um, I chaired a session on virtual labs for STEM promotion, and it, it, it was quite interesting. Uh, the the gentleman or the professor who was uh, presenting is actually a. Uh, uh, um, a gentleman from Côte d'Ivoire, but is is based in the U.S. And as we spoke about open, I know the way to go is open, and we need to open these things. I remember asking him, "Is your content open, or at least a bit of it?" And he said, "No, it's still, you know, um, you have to access at a fee. We still do this and that." And um, and I was thinking, uh, what is it that that we need to do about? Um, some of these things that we are talking about, we are, we are talking about learning to become. So if we cannot access these things as we move forward, so when do we become? When do we get into that uh, space of becoming? So probably we can get, um, I, I think uh, everyone shared a session. Um, probably you can talk just a little bit about your sessions because we, we, we are kind of um, behind on time. So uh, we start probably with Alice. Then we we'll go to Ralitha about your chaired sessions yesterday. Um, Irene, I don't really have much to say about mine because it was the one on, on, on coding. And so we've already said quite a, a bit on coding. It, it, it was an interesting session. It was a well attended session. There was a lot of, of interest and the interest, like Ralitza said, continues to grow um, um, in, in, in terms of wanting to get youth into the coding space because it gives them skills that they, they can apply um, and, 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 and use in this day and age. So I don't really have anything much to say uh, apart from the fact that I did chair a, a, a session on coding. Um, Ralitza, do you have something? Did you, did you oh. chair a session? Okay, I I like to speak um, a little bit about the. I think we'll be going to the slide, but I'll I can speak about it here. I was part of the um, Epica session, okay, and it was more on the um, e-portfolio um, session, and this was um, a new system or the new portfolio ecosystem to improve the quality and visibility of skills. And what they were doing from Mepika was to actually engage about four universities from, um, uh, I think, uh, Makarere University and another company, ICDE, and Manseno, and another um, African Veteran University, plus three more um, universities. And it was actually a, a, an EU-funded project that they were working on as a way of looking into um, introducing the e-portfolio system for lifelong learning and competency-based um, um, e-portfolio system for visualization of students' um, works. And also to sort of introduce badges 
and as a way of encouraging people to um, get onto the system and from their learning, they are also rewarded. One of the other things that also came out was for teachers to be able to transfer the things that people have learned within their, their e-portfolio system into the um, work-based system. So for example, if people are looking for jobs, um, the teachers can actually also recommend through the system to an employer. So they were, the new portfolio system they had created was to offer educational administrations and also the possibility of standardizing competencies and assessments. So it was more or less a standard-based um, e-portfolio system where a lot of universities can actually sign on. Yes, it's actually um, a picker. So if you go to my Documenta um, e-portfolio online, you actually find the details around it and you can have the, the trial version of that. So that was um, what it was about the e-portfolio system. It was quite an engaging um, session and uh, there was a lot of uh, practical base with learners trying to, or participants actually, trying to try their hands on, on things in there and converting objects into different shapes to map sort of problem-based learning into what we actually learn physically. And um, as a way of encouraging educators that they can actually do such things and also upload that as part of the um, e-portfolio system. And that, that was the, the thing about um, EPICA and um, what they are doing for, uh, in the space of um, e-portfolio. So that's, that's it. And then the next thing I can see on the slide, it's about the, uh, virtual, the virtual learning experiences and the core dialogues that we had. Actually, I think this session was chaired by, by Dr. Alice, and, but I can speak a bit about it and then you can add some more. <laughs> Deborah, uh, uh, Debbie, uh, in actual fact, uh, I didn't chair it. I presented okay. it with, with Frederica and you guys filmed it. So you guys got to talk about it and say what you thought. <laughs> 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 okay, I think for me, one of the um, exciting, exciting sessions we attended was this session with um, Frederick and his team from, from, from the Nomad um, company and the International Business and Psychology. And um, um, Dr. Alice was also there and he was, she was also uh, presenting on our e-learning experience. I think it was quite practical. And one of the things that stood up was that there are different ways we can learn. And although we are all talking about the e-learning, e-learning spaces, we can actually see it as another form of learning. So that we know that there's also a space, of course, for the face-to-face -face session, and there's also a space for the e-learning space. And what made this session very engaging was that Everybody, it was designed like that everyone in there could actually participate in activities in there. So we are not just there to listen to the presentations and conversations, but it was also a nice way for everyone to find where they belong in terms of, let's say, in terms of their skills about learning or working online. Are they in the beginning stage, intermediate or advanced? And all those things were a way of grouping or categorizing everyone there so that the kind of presentations we're going to have, we have an idea about the audience in the space. And it also resonated with the concepts that um, this was really practical. And even with our um, practical session, we made it interactive such that we could right there in the session, we were also able to um, respond to online questions and quizzes and all of that, but we did it quite uh, interactively. And at the same time, we were also filming for Facebook Live. So these were the few things. So um, uh, Dr. Alice, would you like to tap on the key, some of the key topics that was in the session? So, oh, Irene? Um, actually, uh, Alice, would you like to say something? Because we have the next, <laughs> the next slide, which, um, uh, you know, talks a little bit about what Frederick uh, presented and, and the take home. 
Yeah, okay. I'll just say that it, it was a really interesting session and it was um, um, uh, quite interactive and, and my co-presenter, um, uh, Frederick, was really uh, a very interesting uh, person who comes into to the facilitation space uh, with a psychology background and has even recently um, uh, authored, co-authored a book called Live Connections, uh, Virtual Facilitation for High Engagement and Powerful Learning. Um, and the session really, it, we hadn't really met each other before this session, but it was just interesting how um, I presented on basically um, how the tools and the strategies and the approaches that we use as Emerge Africa to, to do the work that we do and to, to facilitate our, 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 our events and, and deliver to our, our clientele. And then he came up uh, with some um, very interesting um, strategies and, and techniques that you will hear about um, from, that you'll see in the, in the, next, in the next slide. But it was, it was uh, very interactive and there was a lot of people participation and a lot of spontaneity. Um, Irene and, and, and Andra Litza decided that they were going to try and, 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 and take, you know, take the session live. Uh, certain aspects, aspects of it bombed, but we are always experimental in what we do with Emerge. And, and, and some of the stuff, um, uh, there's links to some of the videos and things from that session, which you can have a look at afterwards. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alice. W one, one of the uh, co uh, connectivity that happened was, was, was how um, Alice's presentation or Emerge Africa presentation just, you know, glided into Frederick's, uh, the nomad, uh, nomadic international business psych of psychologies. Uh, uh, session, you know, it was it was so good. It it, it just went into each other, and it was really nice to to do that. Uh, one of the other things that came up was very many people would like to be connected virtually to this conference. So I think as we move into open in the future, probably the organizers have to think how they are going to be streaming some of these sessions live to people either using whichever methodology. But I think. It's something that should be done. Uh, the live session that we, we, we recorded is on the link that we provided there live on Facebook. And the presentation that Alice uh, made on this session is in that link there. So if you want to see what we presented and what we, we showed there, you can just click on the links. So I, I think we move on to the next session. Uh, on... on uh, improve online learning there were we we observed a lot of we we observed a lot of things with with uh, frederick now we call him frederick um <laughs> from nomadic and some of the take home were the, the the design principles uh for virtual facilitation that that he uses uh the menu for successful online uh, uh session he has made a very beautiful menu um and and actually it, it is it is very attractive and and some of those these are some of the things that he he shared with us so that we can improve on the way we we do our online facilitation he introduced a few things that people can do to relax people in an online space where you actually don't see each other physically so that those were some of the things um, that that he introduced to to the session and and he kept people moving oh one more thing at the beginning we got a a, a link where we could actually uh, um you know, uh, giving our our questions and 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 uh, for for the sessions and and that kind of thing, and I thought that was a really nice way of of people asking questions in a session. So that was also another thing that we learned in that session. Anything else I've missed, Alice? I think that's a pretty uh, uh, good good summary of it. And um, if people are interested in buying um, the book, we will. We will share the details of the book. Um, it's a really good handbook for facilitating. I know you. you we felt that the conference was very uh, cooperative, as as we could say. So um, 
Yeah, um, Jerome, I see that you, you say that you mentioned in another sitting where, where uh, there sh it sh should have been slightly different, but this time it was a lot of it. We had a lot of corporate, we had uh, the launch of the Atingi, the learning platform, we had, everybody was there trying to sell something according to me. And, and um, yeah, so I don't know what, what experience you had, Alice, on, on that. Um, the, it, it, the focus has changed. I think having been to e-learning Africa for over, for many years, there was a time when uh, e-learning e Africa had a lot of focus on, 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 on what was happening in schools. And there were a lot of, uh, you know, uh, people from, from schools, from universities and, and so on, um, participating painting and there is less of that and there's kind of been a, a shift uh to towards the sort of more uh, more corporate focus you've got a uh, you've you've got corporates you've got uh, ngos you've got organizations like giz uh, like unesco like the european union that are are working in collaboration or not in some instances with um with, with, with various institutions to come up with um, various solutions. But it, it's kind of, it's, it's, I kind of feel like, especially when you look at the exhibitions, that it has moved into this other space. And a lot of the stuff that is out there is still proprietary. Some of it has been co-created, but I think that there is room for, you know, more co-creation, more collaboration um, in terms of thinking around the, the, the different solutions that were being uh, peddled there. Oh, thank you. We, 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 I think we, we need to, um, we are towards the end of, of our presentation. Um, and we also, uh, since we started five minutes, so we need to go over just with five minutes. So, um, Atingi uh, was one of the, the, the uh, 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 learning platform that was being shared by, by GIZ. Um, and, and it was all over the place. And they were saying it's for, um, it's for Africa. It's been designed for Africa. So if you could actually go and, and log in, uh, I've given the, 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 you know, the, the, the URL there. If you could log in and just have a feel of it, and see how practical it is for 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 your uh, you know for your space or for your uh, you know what, what you do with with your learners and see if it works. And it, it's also interesting to to do it as yourself. So uh, it was one of those things. I don't know what what take you have on that, uh, Ralita. Just briefly, please, because we are running out of time. Okay, Irene. Uh, thanks for the Atingi link. I think. Um, it 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 was it seems to be quite an exciting <laughs> tool for learning, and um, the launching of it was quite interesting because for them it was a new brand. They wanted to do something that was very African based, and even the name itself, uh, according to the designers who worked on it, indicated that they really took time to make sure that it was customized for the Africans and also for African people. What we saw was that as part of the team, there were a few Africans who seems to be part of the design team for the, for the application. So that was quite exciting, but it looked like that was like the new thing that was being launched as part of the e-learning Africa for this year for people to connect. But they also did quite well to also come up with a book about women in technology in Africa. And you can also find that um, via their, their links, okay? So if you look at the slide where we had the exhibitions, you find um, women um, in tech in Africa. It's a, the PDF version, I think it's free online. So you can look at that to have an idea about the 
the landscape about women in, in IT in Africa as a way of encouraging more females to go into the space. So that's what I can say about that. So um, these are more about the exhibitions. We had a lot of um, companies coming from Germany. It was quite a heavy presence um, to showcase their work um, right from the online spaces and also in other technology-based um, products. It wasn't just about learning online, but some they have developed some toolkits that um, people in the sciences, like engineering, can actually work with those toolkits um, to be able to um, have their practical experiments in their labs, rather than waiting to see a hands-on um, live situation. So you have all your science toolkits at your disposal. It's a portable traveling toolkit that any educator can actually use in different spaces. So it was quite nice to see that. And a few people from, from France uh, or French speaking countries were also there um, at the exhibition stands. And so we also saw that um, from other people also from, from Finland were also trying to share some um, opportunities in Finland for education for young people. And the focus was more on collaborating with other partners and networks like Image Africa um, as a way of connecting with other African um, institutions. So I think it would be also good for us to share that contact from our Finnish um, colleagues that we found out there because the focus was also more on collaboration a lot from the um, Finnish partners at the exhibition as well. Beyond that, it was quite a well set up um, exhibition space and showcasing a lot. So as you can see on the slide, this is our team networking with everybody in the space. And Dr. Alice, myself, <laughs> and then Irene, <laughs> that was us networking. And it was quite an exciting um, thing to do because we learned a lot about people and we also shared a lot about um, Image Africa. And we are looking forward to get more people on our network. And then the plenary session, the debates which was hot <laughs> and very interesting. And we had um, uh, people taking sides for one for the government and then for the young people also taking space. And we had um, Kumba representing young people like myself in Africa. And then we had um, um, another um, lady representing, um, speaking for the government. But from quite an objective view, we realized that everybody was had a space and everybody was sort of making their own points and everybody had something plus from the government's perspective and also everyone also had something plus from the young people's perspective but at the end of the day it was very good and uh, moving forward for us to look at how we can collaborate together and for us to realize that um, providing solutions was not all about government sitting in their offices, but it's, it's a community thing. It's Ubuntu. It's, it's people and people and also government working together. So that was it about the plenary um, session. So I don't know if anybody wants to say anything on this. Otherwise, we can move to the next slide. No, I'd just like to add that it's always a very lively, very, very lively session with, with, with lots of drama and lots of dramatic statements, and it has everybody glued to their seats. You, you, you don't want to move once the debate gets started, and it's, 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 it's the last thing that happens at the end of the, of the conference, but you'd be amazed at how many people actually stay behind till that last session. It's always very... Uh, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Alice and Valitza. I've just shared a, a, a link there. In case you leave before we wind up, please, uh, we would like to get your feedback. Just click on the on the link there and we can we can get your feedback in case you're going. We are almost there. Um, we are almost uh, finished. Alice, will you take us through this as we, we finish the session, please? Thank you. Okay, so the focus of, of the, 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 the focus of, of the, the conference was, was, was really looking at ways 
to get people to learn, to learn with passion, um, to learn in ways that enhance, that, that, that zone into their talents and let them really get passion. I mean, this was the first time that I actually went to a, a conference where they talked about passion, where they talked about talents, where they talked about what people want and how people want to learn and then also try and link the fact that there are these talents and there are these skills that people need to, 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 to enhance to be able to become employable in this um, changing um, environment. So, um, you know, in terms of what was discussed, it's still the need for more open source and, and free tools, especially in our uh, low source and poor infrastructure environment. Um, still the need to make learning accessible to all um, by having uh, policies that support accessibility and also by making sure that there's proper uh, partnerships, there's proper uh, uh, collaboration so, so that and, and, and things like co-creation so that you're not having these helicopter drops coming in and dropping things into, into a space as, as a potential solution without really engaging with the people on the ground for whom the solution is being uh, supposedly uh, developed. And, and the need for the government to collaborate in, in decolonizing uh, education in a way that will um, uh, create a situation where, where youngsters can learn successfully, where youngsters can learn uh, with passion and with interest and learn how to learn and, 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 and have the knowledge that would inform uh, their various, their own practices and the practices of those um, that are are helping to facilitate the learning and the change and the transformation in that space. And Irene? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Alice. Um, yes, this, this, this was quite, um, quite the, the, the e-learning conference. Um, but we also had some impressions of, of Abidjan. Um, it was, it was, we had this beautiful sunset uh, on, on Thursday evening and uh, we were all clicking away and you know, you can see the beauty, uh, the, the, the beauty of the sky. So we at least had something to look forward. I mean, to, to look, you know, after a long day, we've been tired, we've been moving from one room to the other and you know, the sun was like, don't relax, we, are, we got, so those are the impressions that we got from, from that evening. So we come to the end of our presentation and I'm going to give uh, each presenter just uh, half a sec, is, uh, you know, half a minute to, uh, to, you know, to say something about the conference. So we start with Ralista, then we come to Alice, please. Just a, something small, please. All right, um, thank you all for listening and being part of today's session. The conference was quite great. And for me, it was quite nice to see Abidjan for the first time and um, enjoy a bit of French and enjoy the conference and learn how to engage with people in new spaces and learn from all the interactions that was there. I also enjoy being here and thanks for joining us. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Over to you, um, Alice. Alice. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for listening. Um, as you will probably have noticed, um, I've been working with, uh, with Ralitza and, and Irene for this particular presentation. And I have to admit it was strategic. They're clearly uh, very well versed in online uh, facilitation and are not quite as awkward as I am. Uh, it was great attending the the, um, the conference. It was a it was different. It's different from the conferences that um, I've attended before. That um, it's been really interesting listening to Ralitza's perspective because this was her first time to attend uh, uh, Emerge Africa. But uh, sorry, the the um, e learning Africa. But um, what is very clear is that that space is continues to evolve 
and we need to keep watching that space and participating in that space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my, my co-presenters. Um, as we sign out, uh, we appreciate that you are able to attend. Um, we, we noted all your questions, but I'm sure uh, some of the comments and questions, I'm sure we were able to tackle them as we were presenting. Uh, yes, uh, Lydia, it will be nice to attend ELA 2020. I hope it won't, uh, uh, it, it, it will be as interesting and I hope we can move from, uh, from just uh, talking, talking to action in some of these uh, things that, that were presented uh, during the 2019, ELA 2019. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. We appreciate you. And have a good afternoon, wherever you are, or a good evening. Um, bye Thanks, for everyone. Now. Thanks okay. ladies. Bye. Thank Kindly, you, everyone. Thank you so much. Please remember to give us your feedback in the, in the, in the link that I've shared, please. Just, it's, 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 um, it's a survey for about uh, four questions, and, and, and you can just Tell us how you feel about it, please. It will be really, really good to, to have your feedback. Okay, okay, then. Bye, everyone. Bye.